Yay. Last couple of hours, we have had mixed signals from Israel. First reports said that following the Iranian missile strikes on Israel um, over the weekend, the Israeli government was preparing for a major attack on Iran by way of response. Then there were the reports that I discussed yesterday of President Biden of the United States telephoning Prime Minister Netanyahu, telling him that in light of the alleged success of the air defense um, system, the Israeli air defense system, backed by the Western powers in shooting down Iranian missile and drones, the Israelis should congratulate themselves on their victory and should not um, conduct a military strike on Iran. And if they did so, they would not have the backing or the support of the United States. Then, as I discussed yesterday, there were further reports that the United States was getting its allies in the G7 group also to pile up pressure on Israel to persuade the Israelis to um, hold back from launching a strike against Iran. Then over the course of the day, we got lots of reports about meetings on within the Israeli cabinet. Clearly, there was a lot of discussion and argument about what was going on. The Israelis had apparently pulled back from launching their initial strike. We then got a report, or rather a statement from the Israeli cabinet, that Israel did want to coordinate with the United States its attack, eventual attack on Iran, and then later in the evening, shortly before the end of the day, um, the Jerusalem Times, I think, or it might have been the Times of Israel, one of the Israeli newspapers, a newspaper with a rather hard line position, apparently came up with a breaking news story which said that Israel, after what I suspect were intense discussions, had decided to strike back at Iran hard. Well, that was last night. We're still waiting for the Israeli strike. Some sort of Israeli strike I would have thought is inevitable. I'm going to make a guess that just as the Iranian strike that we saw over the weekend was carefully negotiated by the Iranians and the Americans with each other in order to try and avoid an escalation. So attempts are going to be made over the next few hours to do something similar in terms of the preparations for the Israeli strike on Iran. Over the course of my recent videos, I have said why I think neither the United States nor Iran at this time want an uncontrolled escalation of the conflict in the Middle East, of the conflict between Iran and Israel. The United States absolutely does not want another war in the Middle East, which will tie the United States down, um, cause massive problems in the international oil markets, um, cause um, further demands on already overstretched U.S. resources, whereas Iran, for its part, wants to cash in the gains it obtained as a result of the diplomatic breakthroughs it made in 2023, its reconciliation with Saudi Arabia, its joining the BRICS group, its uh, increases in economic growth, its acquisition of weapon systems from Russia, it too at the moment is more concerned to cash in on those gains rather than to place them in jeopardy through an uncontrolled escalation, a conflict with Israel and above all with the United States. So the Americans and the Iranians want to keep the situation under control. They don't want an escalation. That's why the Americans have been all but publicly telling the Israelis to hold back. 
and why the Iranians for their part, as they have themselves acknowledged, went out of their way, firstly to inform the United States in advance about the strike that they were going to launch against Israel. I've already pointed out that this was all but confirmed in that article which appeared in the Financial Times um, about a day before the Iranian strike took place, and also to ensure that the strike, when it happened, was of such a nature that it would not cause losses in lives on the part of Israeli citizens and would only do a limited amount of damage, demonstrating Iran's power, but not leading to, uh, not causing a situation to which Israel would have no choice but to launch a massive response. But I've also said in my various programs, and in particular my programs yesterday, and by the way, also the programs that we've done on the Duran, myself and my colleague and friend Alex Christoforou, that the Americans and the Iranians can come to understandings with each other, but the Iranians, the Israelis, are not parties, are not direct parties to these understandings, that there are multiple pressures within Israel itself. The Prime Minister Netanyahu has what are probably his own visceral instincts to strike back hard, to contend with, and also he's got others, hardline people within his cabinet, um, also to contend with, also to contend with um, as well. And it's far from a foregone conclusion, absent direct American pressure to hold back of a sort that we have not seen, of a sort that, for example, President Eisenhower um, imposed on Israel in the 1950s when he forced the Israelis to pull back from um, Sinai, which they had captured over the course of the 1956 uh, um, Israeli-Egyptian war. Anyway, absent that kind of pressure from the United States, which we are not seeing, it's far from clear that the Israelis themselves will cooperate with any American um, understanding, will fall in with any American understanding or any understanding the Iranians and the Americans may think they have reached with each other. It's this unpredictability of Israeli behavior, of actions, in this very difficult situation, which, by the way, to reiterate again, Israel has created through its attack on the Iranian embassy building in Syria. It is this unpredictability in terms of what Israel is going to do which continues to make this situation as dangerous as it is. So, last night we were told that the Israelis are going to hit back hard. Now that might be rhetoric. <laughs> it might be rhetoric to appease opinion in Israel, or it might be real. It may be that despite all the urgings from Washington, which, to stress again, are in private, they're not backed by warnings of any withdrawal of support, long-term support from the United States. In fact, the opposite is true. Um, despite all those urgings from Washington, from the other G7 states, from France yesterday, from Britain apparently also, um, it's entirely possible. In fact, it's, some would say, likely that Israel is going to simply just ignore all these warnings and is going to plunge ahead and is going to try to launch some major strike on Iran. Well, we're going to have to see what the Israelis actually do. There's talk that they're trying to conduct strikes around Tehran, which are not going to kill or injure Iranian civilians, or indeed Iranians at all that 
The strikes will be of a li in limited in their nature, which would actually make them, if they happen, very like the strikes that Iran has just conducted on Israel. We'll see what these strikes amount to. Of course, it's important to say that if Israel does launch strikes on Iran, even if these strikes are conducted in a moderate and measured way, at least as the Israelis would say, the Iranians might say that there's nothing moderate or measured about them at all. After all, it was the Israelis who started this whole pattern through their attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus, that Iran has given Israel full warning that if Israel does launch any further attacks on Iran, then Iran will respond, and that it will respond more toughly than it did in the strike that it launched over the course of the weekend. And we could, in that case, find ourselves going further up the escalatory escalator, which disastrously the Israelis clambered onto with that attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus around a week ago, two weeks ago. So we'll see what happens. Now, there's a number of further things I wanted to say. Firstly, there are now reports coming out of Iran itself, which are also repeating the claims that Iran used hypersonic weapons in its strike on Israel over the weekend. And the weapon system that apparently, at least the, Isra the Iranians are claiming that they used, is a missile called the Fateh 2. Now, the, the Fateh 2 does exist. There are pictures of it, or at least it appears to exist. As I said, there are pictures of it. It's a liquid a liquid fuel powered missile and apparently it does have a hypersonic glide vehicle warhead a, a, a warhead glide vehicle warhead which apparently uses hyperglockic fuels again people who are more familiar with these sort of things than me uh, would be able to talk about in much more uh, full way Anyway, the Iranians are saying that they launched seven of these missiles against Israel. This is, by the way, a missile system that the Iranians, um, I think I'm right in saying that they um, displayed it only in the second half of 2023. So it's a relatively new missile. At least it's relatively recently that the Iranians um, have showcased it. And the Iranians say that seven of these missiles were launched at Israel and they formed the core of the actual strike, not the hundreds of drones and hundreds of ballistic missiles, some of which by the way might not have been launched by Iran at all, just saying again. But anyway, that um, the actual fist within the bigger cloud of the strike was in fact these hypersonic missiles that apparently seven were launched in total of these very advanced missiles. And the Iranians are claiming that all seven actually got through, that the Iranian Israeli defences are not capable of um, intercepting these missiles. And alongside these seven missiles that got through, there are reports that there were at least nine missile impacts on targets in Israel and if we accept that seven were caused by the Fatah 2 missiles then two others presumably were caused by other ballistic missiles as well and supposedly there are now photographs I haven't seen them but apparently there is now clear photographic evidence that alongside these two air bases that the Iranians targeted both apparently in the Negev desert and which the missiles did reach, though taking care again not to cause particular destruction in these airfields, these two air bases. Along with those two air bases, the Iranians apparently did manage to strike the building 
used by Israel's Air Force intelligence, which is apparently located somewhere in the Golan Heights area. At least those are the reports that I've seen. So it seems that, you know, within the vast cloud of rockets, missiles, drones, there was a real Iranian strike and it hit the targets that the Iranians intended to strike at the two bases and this building used by Israeli Air Force intelligence, that they were able to penetrate the Israeli air umbrella. Now, I want to say that though those are the Iranian claims, they are claims which have been corroborated by satellite uh, pictures and other evidence. There doesn't seem to be any doubt, actually, that this is what has in fact happened. Just say. So, we are looking at a um, successful missile strike in part by Iran against Israel. Now, in previous programs, I have discussed at great length um, my own skepticism that um, Iran would be capable of developing advanced hypersonic glide vehicle warheads by itself. I suspect this is also true <laughs> of the very advanced liquid fuels required to produce a uh, missile. Liquid fuels, by the way, are apparently very tricky. They have advantages in that they give missiles exceptionally high acceleration, which is why the Russians, for example, use them uh, for some of their missiles in place of um, rock, uh, solid fuels, though the Russians also do have many solid fuel rockets. But liquid, liquid fuels are complex, they require a very sophisticated chemical industry to produce. And of course, they're not the easiest things to develop in the first place. Now, I've expressed doubts that the Iranians would be able to do this as quickly as they have done by themselves. I'm going to say the same about the North Koreans. The North Koreans have, as far as I can see, developed a very similar system, uh, a, a missile with a hypersonic warhead. I understand that this system, the Hwasong 16B, uh, also uses liquid fuels. It's possible that the Hwasong 16B and the Fateh 2 are essentially the same system. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, completely wrong about that. But it is very interesting, and I want to just make this point, how suddenly, how fast hypersonic technology is starting to spread. The Russians, back in 2018, announced that they had developed hypersonic missiles. They, of course, developed the very advanced avant-garde strategic hypersonic glide vehicle, for which so far there is no analogue in the world. They developed the Zircon hypersonic cruise missile, for which there is still, by the way, no analogue in the world. And, of course, they developed the extremely, the, the, the less advanced but still very potent, air-launched Kinjal hypersonic missile, which is based on the Iskander ballistic missile. And by the way, as I understand, uses solid fuels, just saying. So we've had all of these Russian developments in 2018. Then after that, the Chinese um, showcased uh, missiles, um, anti-ship missiles, which I understand use hypersonic uh, glide vehicle warheads, and which are clearly designed to attack US Navy carriers. And um, they also demonstrated, I believe it was in 2021, there was a flurry of commentary and discussion about this, 
in the American media and the British media at the time. They also um, apparently um, tested successfully a very advanced strategic hypersonic glide vehicle, similar in some ways to the avant-garde, though having particular um, qualities of its own. And now we've seen the North Koreans also develop ballistic missiles, medium-range ballistic missiles, with hypersonic glide vehicle warheads. Anyway, they've showcased one. Um, it might be a mock-up, but perhaps that would be an unwise thing to suppose. And, well, Iran recently, back in 2023, also showcased a similar, perhaps identical missile with liquid fuels and a hypersonic glide vehicle warhead and has now apparently used it in action, demonstrating its technological prowess. Now, call me a suspicious person, if you wish, but I can't avoid the belief that the reason all of this technology is suddenly appearing in all of these places at once, or so soon after it first started to appear in 2018, is because someone somewhere is, has made the decision to actually distribute the know-how and the technology to various parties to produce these weapons. Now, um, I say that, repeating again, that I don't say that North Korea and Iran are not in their own way technologically sophisticated countries, that they can't produce advanced weapons by themselves, but I still find it very difficult to believe that they produced liquid fueled rockets with hypersonic glide vehicle warheads, which are capabilities which even the United States itself has not yet been able to, to fully develop and place in actual service. So someone, somewhere, it seems to me, has decided to share this technology. Now, it may be more than one person. It may be that the Russians and the Chinese, because they are the two major powers which have the great technological skills, that they've made the decisions to do that and to provide selected allies with this kind of technology. Just, just guessing. Um, the Chinese, as I understand it, have the largest number of supercomputers in the world, which would be extremely important in developing hypersonic glide vehicles. The Russians have supercomputers too, just not on the same scale, but you know, they also have access to supercomputer, uh, supercomputers to carry out modeling and design. The Russians, and this by the way, is something I have some direct knowledge of. The Russians have the by far the biggest data bank in the world on um, um, aerodynamic um, structures based on wind tunnel tests going back all the way to the 1920s. Um, the, this was confirmed to me, by the way, by a very well-informed person at an air show that I attended many, many, many years ago in Britain. I, I'm not going to say more. But anyway, suffice to say that the Russians have vast amount of data of this kind, going back all the way, as I said, to the 1920s. Tsagi, their central aerodynamics um, laboratory, has uh, carefully put together all the tests, and they have huge wind tunnels, and as I said, they've been conducting massive numbers of tests, well, extending back, all the way back to the 1920s. Um, that's why, by the way, Russian fighter jets have such advanced um, 
aerodynamic qualities because the Russians have all this enormous data that they can use to model fighter jet designs and in fact any kind of jet design to ensure that they are the most efficient in operating in um, conditions of in, in air in, in atmospheric conditions and I'm assuming that some of this data at least would be applicable to developing hypersonic glide vehicles so you can see how all of this could have been put together and if it's all been circulated and of course both the Chinese and the Russians have very advanced chemical industries very advanced chemical industries indeed by the way the Russians have just demonstrated the prowess of their chemical industry by the launch of the civilian Angara 5 rocket from their um, new Vostochny Cosmodrome in eastern Russia. Anyway, um, putting all this together, it's perhaps possible to see how this technology is now spreading. Anyway, that does have implications geopolitical implications. It not only means that there's some kind of community of knowledge beginning to appear, but it's important to stress that to the extent that these are anti-ship missiles, and I think that is principally what the Fateh 2 and the Hwasong 16B look like, at least to me, that they're probably primarily intended to launch long-range strikes at hypersonic speeds against US Navy carriers. That kind of capability is only possible if one can keep track of those carriers. That requires um, advanced surveillance, not just from drones, but satellites. That suggests a certain degree of sharing information sharing, again, with the nations that possess these satellites. And notice that recently North Korea has been launching satellites and has apparently been getting help from Russia to do that. After all, Kim Jong-un recently visited the Vostochny Cosmodrome, where he met with Vladimir Putin himself. So just saying, by the way, speaking of North Korea, very recently, North Korea was visited by the third ranking official of the Chinese, Chinese um, of the Communist Party of China and the Chinese government. Very senior man comes, uh, he went to North Korea, had a very friendly meeting with the North Korean leadership, met with Kim Jong-un himself, reaffirming the strong ties of friendship, and, by the way, outright alliance, which exists between North Korea and China. Um, some people are claiming that the Chinese have sent this person to North Korea because they're worried about the fact that North Korea is supposedly tilting more towards Russia recently than to China, and the Chinese want to redress the balance. Given that I suspect that the Chinese and the Russians coordinate their every move together, I think, on the contrary, that there's been a quiet understanding reached between the Chinese and the Russians, that the Russians will take the more public steps towards North Korea, um, um, you know, the more visible technology sharing agreements, that kind of thing, that they will be the people who will supply the oil and the other raw materials to North Korea, which the Chinese are still hesitant about doing because of the issue of the sanctions on North Korea and the threat of sanctions by the United States. So the Russians are doing all of that, and the Chinese, for their part, can... Um, surf on this North Korean-Russian cooperation and build up their own political ties and economic links 
with North Korea on the back of all of this. Anyway, I just discussed all of this. Um, I, I, I should say, of course, that I'm not quite sure about the true capabilities of the Fatir II and of the Hwasong 16B. I mean, it's still possible that these are just mock-ups. We hear lots of claims to that effect. I think that is most unlikely, by, by the way. I think there's every reason to think that the Iranians did launch Fatah twos against Israel over the weekend. And if so, as I said, this has enormous numbers of implications. You can start putting two and two together and coming to all sorts of very interesting. And if I was an American intelligence analyst, potentially alarming conclusions about the way in which various countries in an adversarial relationship with the United States appear to be working together and with the, with the results that the military balance, not just in the Middle East, but around the world, is changing as well. Now, I ought to quickly add two other things. Some people will no doubt ask why, if the Russians have all of these technologies, which they do, liquid propellants, <laughs> hypersonic glide vehicle technologies, why have they not also created missiles with hypersonic glide vehicle warheads intended to attack US Navy carriers? The avant-garde system is a strategic system intended to hit targets in the continental United States as part of a World War III nuclear exchange. Well, there is a very simple reason why the, why the Russians didn't, haven't so far developed such a system, which is that until recently, developing a system like that would have violated the terms of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And this is the treaty agreed by Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan back in the mid-1980s, which prevented the Americans and the Russians from developing land-based ballistic missiles above a certain range, absent, of course, the long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles, which each side had. I'm assuming that the Fatih II and the Hwasong 16B and the Chinese missile with its hypersonic glide vehicle warhead all possess longer ranges and if the Russians possessed comparable missiles they would have violated the terms of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Well the INF Treaty has now collapsed um, neither side, neither the Americans nor the Russians, consider themselves bound by its terms any longer. I think that's a disastrous development, by the way. But, in theory, that opens the way for the Russians to develop a similar system if they choose to do so. Now, because the Russians didn't develop ballistic missiles with hypersonic warheads to attack US Navy carriers, they came up with a completely different technology. Actually, I suspect, in some respects, more advanced, and that is the Zircon hypersonic scramjet cruise missile, which does not violate the INF Treaty because it's shit-based, just saying, but which has comparable range and also incredibly high speeds and poses a danger to American warships all of its own. So that's the first thing that I wanted to say. The second thing is that I've received a rather concerning email from someone, I'm not going to say who, who has been providing me with some um, information about things that are being said in Russia. Again, I don't want to discuss this too far. 
Suffice to say that this information appears to confirm that the Iranians, at least, have obtained some help in developing ballistic missiles from Russia, and by the way, also from Ukraine, which is far from impossible. I remember the American scientist Theodore Postol some years ago pointing out that there were some interesting similarities between a North Korean missile and a Ukrainian, uh, or rather a missile developed by the Soviet Union um, in the Yuzhnoi missile factory in Dnipro, which is, of course, today in Ukraine. That claim, by the way, has been challenged by many people. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But anyway, apart from confirming that Iran does appear to have received some technological assistance from those two countries, this source also said, drawing on information coming from within Russia, that Iran has further capabilities, rather alarming capabilities, which I do not intend to talk about on this program. Now, I'm not sure these capabilities exist. Like, I'm not sure how much of anything exists. Um, but anyway, if this is true, then it is an alarming development indeed. Anyway, there we go. So that was something of a long digression, except, as I said, to say that if Iran does possess liquid-powered high-acceleration rockets with hypersonic glide vehicle warheads, then this is a leap in capability, and it does have major implications, and one that will not have been overlooked in the United States and Israel itself, and which point to very significant and very important developments in the overall geopolitical space. Now, that might explain, by the way, all of this might explain another very interesting conversation that took place yesterday, which is that um, President Putin's national security advisor, Nikolai Petrushev, apparently has had conversations with senior Israeli officials over the course of yesterday. And, um, well, we're not, of course, being told very much about what those conversations involve. But I wonder whether the Israelis aren't, are anxiously asking Petrushev for answers <laughs> to some of the questions that I have posed over the course of this program. Anyway, let's wait and see what the Israelis do. There's some suggestions that it's all going to be confined to a cyber attack. I don't believe that. Um, that there's going to be some strikes on facilities close to Tehran, but trying to avoid casualties, causing casualties. In other words, a symbolic attack. We'll see where all this go is going. But the situation remains extremely dangerous. And if this information that I got from this email is true, which I, I'm not by any means convinced that it is, but just saying, if it is true, it is potentially even more dangerous than people know. <laughs> so let's wait and see. We will find out, no doubt, over the next few days, what the Israelis do. To reiterate, some kind of Israeli strike is inevitable. I don't think that a Israeli government, given the way Israel has boxed itself in, not just recently, but over decades, by this doctrine, hitting hard whenever it's hit itself, um, I, I don't see how Israel can reverse that policy without triggering a massive political crisis in Israel itself. And that all but dictates 
some kind of strike taking place over the next couple of days. We will see how carefully calibrated that is, whether American and G7 pressure is sufficient to moderate what the Israelis do. And then once it's happened, we'll have to wait again, I'm afraid, and worry about what the Iranian reaction in that case is going to be. Now, I've set out all kinds of things here. Um, people are at liberty to come back, obviously, on the threads and wherever, or in emails if they want to write to me and comment about all that I've been saying today about Iranian and other capabilities and some of the connections that I'm making. I accept, by the way, that to some extent I'm joining up dots. I don't know that you know the way I'm joining them up is necessarily true. But anyway, I'll be very interested to see what if what, if anything, people say. But certainly, if the Iranian claims are true, and we have seen photographic evidence from the strikes that suggests that they are true, then the Iranians have demonstrated capabilities which don't just concern Iran, but which pose much larger questions of a global geopolitical nature, which should cause worry in Washington and amongst the collective West states. Anyway, let's move on and now discuss what's going on in that other great conflict. And the first thing I want to say is that we're now getting reports that in some incredibly overcomplicated way that I don't fully understand, Mike Johnson is proposing next week to put some together some kind of appropriations package um, next week. And this package will apparently reconstitute separate standalone packages for Israel, Taiwan, and perhaps Ukraine. The media in the United States is suggesting that it will include Ukraine. There's apparently been massive pushback within the Republican caucus um, in the House of Representatives against that idea. I get the sense that nothing has been announced up to this point. No major decisions have yet been set, made, made. We will see what happens over the next couple of days. Let me reiterate again a point I've made before. If, is, if Ukraine does get its $61 billion appropriation from the United States, then as J.D. Vance correctly said in that article in the New York Times, which I discussed yesterday, it will not change the outcome of the war. The United States, the Western powers, have provided Ukraine with vast quantities of weapons and huge support for its economy. The support for its economy has been going back all the way to 2014. The weapons supplies apparently started even before President Obama lost office, even though, in theory, he had prohibited the supply of weapons to Ukraine. However, I've read that the entire bureaucracy, the uh, national security bureaucracy and the defense bureaucracy in the United States collectively rejected President Obama's decision, even whilst he was president. And they seem, perhaps with his knowledge, to have simply ignored his order. And I am absolutely certain, in fact, I have no doubt, that some weapon systems, especially javelins and stingers and others, were already being supplied to Ukraine whilst President Obama was, president, was, was still president. And more weapon supplies, many more weapon supplies apparently, were sent by the Europeans, and armed supplies increased after President Trump lifted formally President Obama's restriction 
in 2018. I'd underestimated at the time, by the way, the quantity of supplies that the Americans and the Europeans were sending to, the, to Ukraine, even though the Russians were constantly warning about it, as I remember. And of course, there was a massive increase in supplies after the start of the special military operation in 2022, with a million shells supplied to Ukraine over the course of 2022, with many, many more shells and tanks and all kinds of heavy equipment supplied to Ukraine in 2023. And the net result of all of that was that Ukraine has still lost huge amounts of territory. Its army has been decimated. Its great offensive last year was a disastrous failure. $61 billion of aid on top of all that aid, which Ukraine has already been provided with, is not going to change the situation. And in fact, General Cavalli, who is the military chief of NATO, senior American general, apparently a clever man. He says, he said to NATO, he told, he told Congress, he told the Senate Armed Services Committee that the Russian army is actually now larger by 15% than it was when it invaded Ukraine in 2022. Frontline troop strength has increased from 360,000 to 470,000. Um, um, he said that this means that Russia has the ability to enlarge the pool of available military conscripts by 2 million for years to come. This is because the Russians have now increased the maximum conscription age from 27 to 30. He says that in sum, Russia is on track to command the largest military on the continent. Regardless of the outcome of the war in Ukraine, Russia will be larger, more lethal and angrier with the West than when it invaded. And uh, this, of course, mirrors what was said by Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell recently when he said that the US had assessed that over the course of the last couple of months, Russia has almost completely reconstituted militarily. So Lloyd Austin's famous plan to use the Ukrainian war to weaken Russia as proved a catastrophic failure. The Russian economy is booming. The Russian military is stronger than ever. <laughs> Certainly a lot stronger than it was in 2022. And the West is weaker than it was in 2022. The West is perhaps producing rather more shells, but nowhere near enough. Its plans to produce more shells will not match Ukrainian needs, let alone its own. It can't produce the Patriot missile interceptors that are needed to provide blanket coverage of Ukraine. The Patriot missiles cannot intercept Zircon hypersonic cruise missiles, as we have seen. They're not particularly good in shooting down um, um, other types of Russian missiles either, and using them to shoot down cheap drones like the Geranium-2 is a catastrophic waste of resources and placed directly into Russian hands. So from every perspective, from every point of view, um, this project of supporting Ukraine militarily has been a failure. And as J.D. Vance says, throwing, adding another $61 billion into the mix is simply throwing good money after bad and is increasing even further the extent of the um, Ukrainian um, debacle when it eventually comes. And fascinatingly, there's even been an article to precisely this effect in The Economist of all places. Now, The Economist is not saying that the Western powers should reduce or limit their um, support for Ukraine. The Economist, hell will freeze over before um, The Economist ever says anything like that. But it has now written an incredible article. It says, what happens if Ukraine loses? Question mark. 
Russia victory would be debilitating for the West and especially for Europe. Um, and it says that although a vanquished Ukraine has become a less far-fetched prospect than it was, it is no less, no less frightening. A defeat for Ukraine would be hu a humili humbling episode for the West, a modern Suez moment. Suez, of course, was the crisis in 1956 when Britain and France entered into a secret agreement with Israel, <laughs> which the, the details of which were only confirmed many, many years later, whereby the Israelis launched an attack on Egypt, gained control of the Suez Canal, of the Sinai Peninsula. The French and the British used that as a pretext to attack Egypt itself in order to seize control of the Suez Canal. President Eisenhower of the United States was incredibly angry about all of these um, maneuvers that the British and the French were engaging in, and the Israelis. He saw this as an attempt by the British to preserve their empire, and he basically told the Israelis to pull out, and the British and the French to do the same. And he also arranged for pressure to be placed on the pound sterling, which forced the British to do the same. And that was the, a humiliating moment for Britain, and was actually the final big nail in the coffin of the British Empire. From that moment on, it was all a question of retreat. And what The Economist, which remember is a British magazine, is saying here is that if there is a defeat in Ukraine, then the collective West, the West collectively, faces a Suez moment. In other words, the period of its global dominance will be seen to have gone and if one follows the pattern of what happened to Britain and by the way France after Suez it is inexorable retreat the end of empire from that moment onwards and then in case there should be any doubts about this he goes on to say the economist goes on to say having provided moral, military, and financial succor to its ally Ukraine for two years now, America and Europe have perhaps inadvertently put their own credibility on the line. I've said that. Alex Christoforou, my colleague and friend, has said that. So many others have been saying that for ages. Um, I've been saying that before the war even began. I remember saying something similar to that in 2014. Emmanuel Todd, tremendous academic, famous um, commentator on these matters, he sensibly made exactly this point in an article I remember that was published in, I think it was the autumn of 2022, that if the conflict in Ukraine is existential for Russia, it's becoming, it is becoming dangerously existential for the United States as well, in the sense that if the United States is seen to suffer a defeat at Russia's hands in Ukraine, then the consequences in terms of the way the world perceives the United States and thinks about American power will be forever changed. And um, the economist puts it rather um, foolishly, it says that in Russia, but also China, India, and across the global south, Ukraine's Backers would be dis dismissed as good at tabling UN resolutions and ha haggling over wording at EU and NATO summits, but not much else. Again, The Economist, diehard neocon magazine as it is, 
reduces everything to a question of will. Whereas in reality, as again, Alex Vashinin, Brian Valetic, uh, um, J.D. Vance now, so many others have been saying, it's not will, it's capability. This is why the West should have worked hard to achieve peace in Ukraine, to avoid a war in Ukraine at all, should have got behind and backed the Minsk agreement, at the very least, rather than worked to undermine it. And why one reason, there are many actual reasons why they should be doing this, but one further reason why they should have been trying not to support Ukraine once the war began, but to try to find a way out of this mess by trying to come to some kind of negotiated settlement with the Russians. And because it is capability, not willpower, that is going to decide this war, the credibility which the economist now says is on the line and which the Americans and the Europeans staked inadvertently, I would say arrogantly, they didn't realize that they were staking their credibility on this conflict because they assumed that it would be easy to succeed in it because they all told each other that Russia is a house of cards and if they blew hard enough, it would fall over. Just saying. But anyway, that credibility, which The Economist is talking about, is indeed going to suffer an almighty blow. But there we are. I've talked about this for a long time. The Economist is starting to see the dangers. It's starting to talk about the possibility of defeat for Ukraine. And it does seem that we are moving closer and closer to that point. Faster and faster. Now that now brings me to that perennial topic of these programs, which is the actual military situation in Ukraine. Now yesterday there was another uh, missile strike by the Russians um, on Ukraine. Um, I don't have the full details. There are so many Russian missile strikes on Ukraine now that one gets the sense that they're becoming, in effect, almost routine. And for that reason, perhaps, we don't give them as much attention as we should do. But anyway, they did carry out a missile strike of some kind. When I have more details and have more information, I will talk about it. But in the meantime, we are getting more and more information about what is happening on the front lines and, to put it mildly, for Ukraine, things are starting to get not just bad, but critically bad. Yesterday, I said that the Russians have carried out an operational encirclement of the micro-district of Chasovia. They've cut off the Ukrainian troops that are fighting there. There's reports later, there were reports later yesterday and early this morning that they've captured more positions within the micro district, that the Russians have captured more positions within the micro district. And I discussed yesterday that they're already sending messages to the Ukrainian troops holding out in the micro district, calling on them to surrender because they are effectively encircled. Now, the Ukrainians, becoming aware of this crisis, are now transferring operational reserves, except that they're not really reserves. They're transferring troops from Kupiansk, from the area around Kupiansk, to try to hold back the Russians in Chasovya. I don't think it's so much about rescuing the micro-district. I think that is lost. I think even the Ukrainians understand that. But trying to at least stem the Russian advance and accelerating encirclement of the main part of Chasovya, which lies to the west of the canal. I think the Ukrainians understand that Krasnogorovka, which I'm going to 
come to shortly, is about to fall, or will soon fall. They don't want to lose Cha Sophia at the same time. Of course, they don't want to lose Cha Sophia at all. So they're transferring troops from Kupiansk. Now, that is a dangerous thing to do, because the Russians have just created a group of forces north, as I discussed, whose uh, remit appears to be the Kharkov region. It is likely that we're going to see many more Russian troops operating in the area of Kharkov over the next few days, weeks maybe, perhaps at the end of May, who knows. But anyway, Russian forces are building up in the north, in the Kharkov area, where Kharkov city itself has only limited supplies of electric power, which the Russians can probably cut off now at will. Um, the Russians are building up there, and because of the crisis around Chasofya, the Ukrainians, far from strengthening their positions in Kharkov region, are having to transfer troops from there to try to plug the gaps in Chasofya. There's been many discussions by many people about the effect of the constrictor strategy that the Russians are imposing on the Ukrainians. The attacks on, of, of, on a broad front along many parts of the front line simultaneously. The fact that it's forcing the Ukrainians to shuttle units from one part of the front line to another, the danger that that might cause an uncontrolled collapse in one location, creating a cascade effect. And we're starting to see how in Kharkov region, because of the pressure on Chasofya, that might soon happen with Russian pressure on the front lines almost certain to increase further over the next few weeks. Now, I ought to say that Kirill Budanov, no less, has actually made some rather interesting statements about Russian intentions. He gave an interview, or he gave a, made a statement, yes, a public statement, in which he said that he expects the Russians to launch a big offensive at the end of May or beginning of June, um, he said that the Ukrainians are well prepared for it. But he also said that unless they got full support from the West, it would create a catastrophic situation. I've already said that aid from the West cannot retrieve this situation. If we're talking about artillery shell production, um, the West is not going to be in a position to significantly increase production of Western-produced shells before the end of 2025, as I understand it now. Um, President Pavel's plan to, pro provide, to provide Ukraine with shells from the international arms market has supposedly come up with 180,000 shells, which is far less so far than the 800,000 he was talking about. But by the way, it would be consistent with the information about extra additional supplies of shells to Ukraine that I got from a source a short time ago. But anyway, Kirill Budanov perhaps doesn't quite understand this, but Ukraine is not going to get the resources from the West that it needs to turn this catastrophic situation that he's predicting around. And we can see why this redeployment of troops from Kupian to Chasofya is itself signalling that that catastrophic situation is coming. I'm also going to say something else. I think it is most unlikely that redeployment of further units to Chasofya is going to materially change the situation there. When 
General Sirsky took over from General Zaluzhny. He too rushed, he, he rushed forces, just as he's doing now, from Kupiansk to Chasovya. He rushed forces from Zaporozhye and other places to um, Avdevka in order to try to stabilize the situation there. It slowed the Russians for a few weeks, but as we'll come, as we'll see in a moment, at the price of heightening the fourth, the inevitable catastrophe. And I suspect the same thing will happen in Chasovya. More troops are going to be sent to Chasovya by Ukraine, where they will also be devoured by the new meat grinder that the Russians are setting up for the Ukrainians there. But there is a further intrigue about what is going on in Chasovya. I discussed how the 67th Brigade, there are, were reports yesterday that the 67th Brigade, based on the right sector, paramilitary, far-right political group, which played, by the way, a central role in the Maidan events of 2013-2014, how the 67th Brigade is apparently being disbanded, how the Russian, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, General Sirsky, has decided to disband that brigade, apparently because of its serial insubordination. We have also seen that there has been identical insubordination by the 3rd Assault Brigade, which is, of course, the Azov Brigade, the reconstituted Azov Brigade. They refused orders to counterattack in the Avdevka area when Sirsky sent them there. This was back in February. They <laughs> refused orders recently to redeploy to Chasovya. They've been acting increasingly like a force to themselves. And there are reports this morning that Sirsky has also decided to disband the 3rd Assault Brigade and that an announcement to that effect is going to be made very soon. And all of this following further reports that the 25th Airborne Brigade, which is a paratroop brigade, one of whose units, one of whose battalions is supposed to have surrendered in the Vodyanye area west of Avdevka about a couple of days ago, that that is being disbanded as well. It looks as if there's a crisis developing between General Sirsky and some units within the Ukrainian military system. These seem to be the more ideological units, formerly close to um, General Zaluzhny. The, these units seem to be unwilling to accept Sirsky's orders. Sirsky is facing insubordination from them. And, well, tangling with these units is perhaps politically dangerous, but it seems to be what Sirsky feels that he is obliged to do. Now, we will see what that means. These units number amongst them people with a history of violent political activity. I don't think that's a controversial statement. They've already in the past made threats against President Zelensky himself. President Zelensky, by the way, his official term ends in May. He's extended it without elections on the grounds that there's martial law and that the war is underway. But that might open up challenges to his political legitimacy. We will see. But anyway, there's some reasons to think that the political situation is starting to become tense and that this is starting to have effect on the situation on the front lines. Anyway, that is Chasovya. Perhaps even more dramatic is the news of what is coming from 
the Avdevka area. And here it looks as if we are looking at the start of a potential collapse and major breach of the entire front line. Now, yesterday I spoke about how the Russians had apparently advanced up the railway to the northwest of Avdevka, that they appear to have advanced into the Zarya micro district, the Dacha community, which is located along the railway, that this is putting them within striking distance of Ocheretino. And now reports are starting to appear that they reached Ocheretino itself. Now, I'm not sure that this is true, and it could be that some of these reports are confusing this battle, ongoing battle for the Dutchers on the railway south of Ocheretino with Ocheretino. But if there's been one pattern in terms of Russian advances over the last few weeks, it's that very often the furthest reported Russian advance turns out to be the actual Russian advance. Perhaps the Russians have arrived at Ocheretino itself. And that would be a dramatic development. That would mean that Ukrainian forces to the east of Ocheretino, caught between the Russian advance up the H-20 road highway, east of Novokalinova and Keramik, are now caught in a pincer, but it would also, if the Russians capture Ocheretino, mean that the Russians control the high ground. I would add that I can remember vividly, way back in the autumn, a whole series of analytical reports in, of all places, the London Times, explaining the critical importance of Avdevka, for the entire Ukrainian defense position in central Donbass, and also highlighting the significance of Ocheretino and saying that if the Ukrainians were to lose Ocheretino as well as Avdevka, then it would be a catastrophe for them and that their entire defense position in central Donbass might start to come apart. That was from the London Times. And if these reports that I'm getting this morning and which were starting to appear late last night are true, then we might be very close to that position. But beyond that, I also spoke yesterday about how the village of Novobachmutivka, which I had at one point confused with the Zarya Dacha community, appears to be located some distance from this Dacha community and the railways, somewhat to the west, but lies on a stretch of road which the Ukrainians have been using to keep the 47th Mechanized Brigade, which has been defending Ukrainian positions in Berdichi, to keep that unit supplied. Anyway, I said that there were reasons to think that the Russians were now advancing west from the railway towards Novo Bakhmutivka and that they might also be in the process of cutting this road. Yesterday, the reports came through that the Russians have indeed cut the road. Um, I should say that Sirsky himself recently admitted that with the ground becoming harder, the Russians are able to carry out armoured assaults across dry ground, hard ground, across the fields, moving their troops faster than has been the, true, the case up to now. That might be able to explain these rapid Russian thrusts. Anyway, they've allegedly, they've cut off, they've cut the road, which goes south towards Berdici. There's apparently now confirmed film evidence 
which confirms that the Russians have captured the village of Semenyovka, immediately to the south of Berdichi, which is the village that lay between Orlovka and Berdichi itself. It looks as if no less a unit than the 47th Mechanized Brigade, the unit that was trained and equipped by the West to form the spearhead of Ukraine's disastrous summer offensive, the unit which had the, has the Bradleys and also initially the Leopard 2 tanks and then the Abrams, Abrams tanks. It looks like the 47th Mechanized Brigade is either already in a state of operational encirclement or could very soon find itself in one. So, a major crisis for the Ukrainians, perhaps developing north of Avdevka. Now, I want to say again, a lot of these reports are very, very sketchy. It may be that the situation is not quite as dramatic as I've said. I'm not sure that the Russians have indeed reached Ocheretino. It may be that people are confusing the Zarya Dacha community for Ocheretino. It's not certain, as far as I know, that the Russians have advanced to Novo Bakhmutivka or that they've cut the road. But it does look as if all of these events are threatened and could happen over the next couple of days. And it is possible that they have happened already. And it seems that Russian control of Semenyovka, or at least by far the greater part of it, has actually been confirmed by uh, film evidence. So, a terrible crisis for Ukraine, starting to develop along the northern, north of Avdeevka. And an equally terrible crisis, apparently, starting to develop for the Ukrainians. To the west of Avdeevka, the Russians, as I said previously, launched an armoured advance west of Toninka and Orlovka. They reached the three villages of Umanske, Jasnobrodovka, and Netalevo. They captured uh, Vodyanye and Pervomaisky. All of that's been confirmed. The capture of those two villages has already been confirmed by the Russian Defence Ministry. Um, latest reports suggesting that they've actually achieved some kind of operational encirclement of Jasnobrodovka, and perhaps are advancing in Natalovo as well, and that they're cutting the roads between these places, and that they've also entered um, Umansky as well. So it looks like, again, overstretched Ukrainian forces um, running out of equipment in this area, suffering terrible losses. And further south, reports this morning from Redovka, normally a reliable um, Russian newspaper in terms of its war reporting, even as if it is very much, as I said, on the nationalist patriotic side of the political spectrum in Russia, talking about significant Russian advances in Krasnogorovka, um, again, not always entirely easy to know what precisely is happening. I said some time ago that once Pervomaisky fell, the positions of the Ukrainians in Krasnogorovka would become untenable, and that does seem to be the case. And it seems that there's been a massive destruction of Ukrainian artillery to the west of Krasnogorovka, and... Radovka is talking about the Russians having enlarged their area of control within Krasnogorovka, the bombing of, by the Russian Air Force of Ukrainian positions in this town is of extraordinary intensity. And it looks like we are perhaps in the early stages of a collapse in Ukrainian defences in Krasnogorovka as well. So... It looks as if a fist is uh, a Russian fist, 
an armoured fist, <laughs> is in the process of punching through the Ukrainian defence lines in the centre, at the very centre, in this area of between Marinka and Avdevka, with another operation, serious operational crisis for the Ukrainians further north around Chasov Yar. Now, there's been more reports about the state of the Ukrainian economy. Um, I noticed we, we talked about this on a recent program in um, the Duran, Alex Christoforo and I, our old friend Samantha Power, once the United States' ambassador to the UN, um, has recently spoken about how the Ukrainian economy is achieving 5% growth and all of that and has managed to um, overcome the pressures that it, is, it has been experiencing. Um, I said over the course of that program without, with Alex Christoforo that, there is, that this is absolute and complete nonsense. The former British diplomat Ian Proud who is an expert on economic matters, has, by the way, written a brilliant article. Uh, I believe it's on antiwar.com, but you can find it in various places, actually demolishing the entire theory that Ukraine's economy is in anything else other than a terminal condition. And, in fact, we're starting to see signs of that. Despite enormous support from the West and strong capital controls, the Ukrainian currency, the Grivnia, is weakening and has been weakening fast over the last few weeks, which suggests that pressure on the Grivnia is intensifying, that more and more people are converting their Grivnias into foreign color, currency, presumably dollars or euros. That might suggest that people, more people want to leave Ukraine. It's a sign of growing demoralization in the country. Bear in mind that the Grivnia is not a freely floating currency in the way that the ruble is. So currency movements with the Grivnia, I believe the latest fall is of a level of 9%, actually are more significant than they would be for a freely floating currency and must represent a significant drain on Ukraine's foreign currency reserves. So, gathering crisis in Ukraine, West has staked its credibility, it's put its credibility on the line. If there's a defeat, it will be a humbling episode for the West on modern Suez, as The Economist tells us. Or completely predictable, completely predicted. No one, however, has any plan that I can see in the West to do anything about it. Perhaps if Donald Trump, if he can overcome his legal problems and gets himself elected, he might be able to reverse course, but I don't see much sign of that. Um, Chancellor Olaf Scholz of Germany was given a stern lecture by Xi Jinping about Ukraine. I'm going to discuss that in my next program tomorrow. We have a fascinating Chinese readout about this, but no real sign that anybody in authority in the West is really seeking to change course. As we saw, as was recently discussed, the United States has no plan B, it only has a plan A, and it can't really escape that. So, we are getting ever closer to that modern Suez moment. Of course, there have been these reckless plans, send troops to Ukraine that Macron has been talking about, doesn't look like that's going to happen. The United States has just ruled out sending its air force into Ukraine to shoot down Russian missiles. Um, uh, Admiral Kirby 
had no hesitation batting that idea down. Some journalists asked him, you know, if you can shoot down Iranian missiles to protect Israel, why can't you do the same for Ukraine? Anyway, Admiral Kirby said, no way, indication that the United States really, really, truly does not want to become militarily involved in Ukraine. So no real sign of how to change this trajectory of events. Some very dangerous ideas floating around. And of course, possibilities of reckless miscalculations and steps being taken, which could land us all in World War Three. I- I'm not going to discuss the failure of Western diplomacy here. Western diplomacy is also, it seems, at risk of failing in the Middle East. Also wholly predictable. And far away, China watches, waits, doesn't, as far as I can see, look to make the situation worse, actually comes up with constructive ideas that no one listens to, but well positioned to take advantage. A serious moment, I think, that underestimates it. Anyway, that's enough from me today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to also to check out our shop. You can find all sorts of amazing things there. Links under this video for all of these things, our platforms, Patreon and subscribe star in our shop. And last but not least, if you like this program, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More to, from me soon. Have a very good day.